Shaker Borkar and Telfel was originally scheduled to give the talk. Uh, for those that don't know, Shaker retired recently. I've been working for him for many years and uh, kind of taking over the team he's leaving behind. But he did ask me to make it clear he retired from Intel, not the community. You can expect to see him at events poking people in the eye with a sharp stick in the near future. I'll also say I've never seen John dressed that well before. Uh, <laughs> okay, so. Uh, let's start by talking about what is Moore's Law. John had a couple of things I'm going to come back to. But Moore's Law is a business statement, it's not an engineering statement. You need to decouple these things in your brains. So it's a business statement that about every two years, and the numbers changed 18 months, two years, 30 months, pick a number, uh, but small digit number of years, uh, we double things. Right? We double devices. Today we're talking transistors. There's other devices you can think about doubling. Uh, we are getting performance increases, we're getting energy reductions, we're doing it for basically a constant level of power and cost. And the idea here is, from a business motivation, if you're going to have a technology, you're going to continue to grow an ecosystem, this needs to be a true statement. Then there's the engineering side. John mentioned Denard scaling and the fact that maybe it died, maybe it didn't die. But classically, the recipe for engineers to achieve Moore's Law of transistors has been scalar dimensions, scalar supply, and you're done. You just keep turning the crank on this over and over and over again. Uh, kind of the running joke is that many years ago in the fabs, we used a handful of elements in the periodic table. Today we use almost all the elements but a handful in the periodic table to get the same job done. It's still just a recipe. Right? But what happens when the recipe fails? I.e., the sky is falling, chicken little, there's no more Moore's Law, oh my god, what are we going to do? The answer is, go off and think about it. And there's different dimensions to think about it. You'll hear some of those from uh, others talking about maybe non von Neumann uh, or other approaches, but at the end of the day, right, it's still Moore's Law as a business statement, not the engineering statement. So, what does it mean to really talk about this? We can look at the evolution of electronics, right, and how it's impacted things. We had mechanical, moving to electromechanical, vacuum tubes, bipolars, NMOS, PMOS, ultimately CMOS, and now this question about what's coming. If you look at the trend line historically, you look at the technologies and what happened, what is it, each of the crossings? Right? Each of the crossings was defined by having three basic components. You have to have gain, you have to have signal and noise control, and you have to have scalability. Although scalability is a really overused term. What does scalability really mean? You're talking about three dimensions. You've got performance, you've got energy, you've got price uh, performance. So the question is not, what am I doing for any given technology? The question is, do these apply or not? So I can look at these almost as a form of tenets, right? And there's a corollary, I'm going to peg John for this. But the three basic tenets are gain, right? I have a signal coming in, I apply some additional energy to it, and I have gain of that signal so I can do something with it on the other side. The other is signal noise isolation. Right? I have to be able to make sure that I amplify the signal and I can control the noise if I can't eliminate it. It needs to be within certain thresholds. The last one is I have to have scalability in some metric, whatever that metric may happen to be. Could be physical shrinking, could be adding cores, could be doing something else. But these are the three fundamentals to actually be a viable technology. Then there's this other tenet, the plus one, which is the shelf tenet, right? Which is it needs to be friendly to high volume manufacturing. If I can't manufacture it at scale, I'm over. Right? I cannot use this technology. I need to drive this ecosystem to keep making forward progress to be able to say these four things are true. And Maybe there's a fifth one that we were talking about before this, so hold on to it till the panel. Uh, but there is something else missing from this slide. Uh, so anyway, let's go back and talk about scaling. You can look at electromechanical relays. Right? You start out in 1928 with the Otis elevator, this large physical construct. You can look at what we've gone to today. Very, very different. But this is the effect of scaling over 70, 80 years. Right? It continues to get better. It will continue to get better to a certain point. And then the question is, what comes after this? You can also look at vacuum tubes. You had the 20s vacuum tube, moving into the 30s vacuum tube, moving into the audio favorite vacuum tubes. If you're an audiophile, maybe you still use these today, maybe you don't. But there's a continued scaling of the technology, and even though the technology isn't widely used anymore, there are still some domains where it's very actively sought after. On the semiconductor front, you've got the first transistor, everybody knows about that, and then you can look at what we're doing with it today, and then it ultimately led to the integrated circuit and that led in turn to things like the Intel processor family. Everybody knows and enjoys and can't imagine anything better, right? 
So we can look at the scaling over the decades, right? And this is going to amplify some of those curves John was talking about. Right? You've got in cubic meters, right? What am I doing in a technology to achieve something? You get a very, very nice curve. Right? It is continuing to scale, even though Moore's law is over, according to the rumor. CMOS is over, according to the rumor. I do chuckle at the notion of one nanometer. That's a great joke. Uh, I can look at delay in terms of seconds on these same technology curves. Right? You've got, again, the vacuum tubes, the bipolar, and everything else. It continues to scale out. It's doing quite nicely. I can look at the energy in terms of joules. Right? Now I start to see a little trouble there at the end. Right? It's not quite working the way I want it to work. Something's happening at the transistor level. But I can also look at cost. Cost continues very aggressively. We are able to continue to double or you know, drive down costs. So there's a little sign of trouble here, and that may be feeding the chicken little hysteria that Moore's Law is over, and we have these fundamental things we've got to go back and rethink or redo. Is that a true statement? I would argue no, but we'll see what comes out. So what's inside of Prasimos, right? What technology do we have on tap that's going to show gain? What are we going to do about signal-to-noise ratio, particularly at room temperature? It's great to have an academic paper that says, oh, we've got this great new technology that only works at minus 200 Kelvin. Uh, sorry, that's not viable unless you're going to launch into deep space on the dark side of the moon. So we have to have real factors in how we look at this. Same thing with silicon photonics. Classically, the industry was very bad about doing full power reporting. They would omit things like the laser and their power numbers. And once you factor back in the laser, suddenly the power is not nearly as good as it looked like before. So there's other factors like this. We have to worry about scalability, performance, costs, energy, all these things factor in, and we really have to look at it. So research needs to continue because we need to find the one. We need to find the neo of the next generation. But once you find it, and once you work out the techniques, you still have a long haul to make it something we could use, something that's viable for mass production. So until then, what are we going to do? Right, the short version is CMOS is going to continue. It's not because necessarily it's the best technology. It's not because we particularly like it and adore it. It's because we have no choice. We have to keep doing it to keep everything moving forward. So there's three ways to look at this. And the first is we're going to remove the waste. We're going to go back to reclaiming efficiency. The second is we're going to employ known techniques, which have been avoided for one reason or another. But when I say they're known techniques, these are things that have been documented for years. They are known how to do it. There are known side effects. People have wanted to avoid doing it because it was considered hard in some metric of hard. Too hard to program, too hard to use, too much effort to design. But when you're running out of other knobs, the things that you know how to do that were hard before aren't as hard anymore. And the last thing you're looking at are multidisciplinary solutions. Right? It's not just about the physical manufacturing. There are other dimensions to this. How do you use it? What are you doing to take advantage of the resources? So, reclaiming the waste, what are we talking about? This is one of those classic shaker graphs, uh, and I argued over whether this graph actually makes sense, but I'm going to stick with it because I think it's entertaining. What you're looking at here across the x-axis, you're looking at the transition from the 386 to the 486, which is on die, cash, and pipeline. 486 to the Pentium, which added a second pipeline of the same basic design and some other bells and whistles. Then you've got your out-of-order speculative core. This is your first major the P6 architecture, right? Pentium Pro. You go from that to the D pipeline. We're talking here the P4 family, where the idea was to take a little less energy efficiency in each pipe stage, but dial the frequency to 11, right? Take it up to 10 gigahertz. Then you've got back to non-D pipelines, a transition back to the core architecture after the Pentium 4 experiment, politely said, didn't work, uh, and what it looks like. So, We've got these dimensions. We're going to look at die area, energy performance, floating point performance, and overall energy efficiency of the choice. So this is why the graph is a little bit subtle. Right? What you're looking at in that first bar on the iDie cash pipeline architecture is the area multiplier from the 386, a little over 4x. When I normalize the technology and I do a comparison of jumping to the Pentium, it was a little bit 3x bigger than the 486, making that second pipeline change and some other minor modifications. From an ISA level, if you've ever looked at the Pentium versus the 486, there's two instructions different. Right? They're not interesting instructions. They don't account for 3x of the area. So then we can look at the area increase going into the, the out of order and so on. So what you see here is a trend line that until you get down to the reduction of the core architecture, right, this bet against more complicated things is taking more space. I can look at energy performance. 
four to six, beat the pants off of three to six every day of the week. You know, going to the Pentium was even better. We kept getting better and better and better. And even when we did things to physically reduce the complexity and bring back some of the area, our performance didn't slip very bad against our projections of what we wanted to do. Floating point is a completely different story. It was just out of the park by actually doing something crazy like adding floating point directly to the hardware, right? as opposed to having this dedicated coprocessor off to the side on a slow bus. So you can also look at energy efficiency. What's the big win here? The big win here is energy efficiency. By choosing directly to simplify the design, to roll back the clock, if you part of the pun, on the Pentium 4, and not target 10 gigahertz, but target 2 to 3 gigahertz, energy efficiency shot way back up. It also brought some of the other factors under control. So we're going to reclaim the efficiency, get back to the scaling parameters I was talking about earlier by doing things to get rid of the waste. I can also look at those known techniques I was talking about. Known because we know exactly how to do them, and we just have to look at it. Here's an example about T-fets, tunneling fets. The idea is when you look at the drain current versus the gate voltage, this is classic transistor diagrams, right? You can look at the CMOS subthreshold, right, 60 millivolts a decade, and what you see is the leakage there because this is where you're below your, your target. T-fets are basically giving you a much deeper curve. So their leakage is fantastic compared to classic transistors. What's the drawback of the T-FET is that you have this big gap in the amount of current that actually flows, lowers your total performance. The idea is I could do T-FETs brilliantly as long as I don't try to push back about 100 megahertz. When I want to go over 100 megahertz, the T-FET's not going to work very well. I can then go back in at the recipe level in the fab and I can tweak the materials involved in the T-FET to get the performance back up, but the curve looks exactly like the regular transistor. Why am I doing this exercise? because I have transistors. So the takeaway from this is that we do get benefits from things like TFETs, but we have to go back and look at what are we trying to do with the technology, where does it fit, where does it make sense, and am I doing the wrong tool for the wrong job? I can also look at near threshold voltage operation. Complicated graph, we'll do a little animation here. What you're looking at is the frequency, right, in blue versus the voltage across the bottom. And what you see is that maximum voltage frequency is nice and high, but as I start to bring the voltage down, right, the frequency correspondingly falls. I can also look at, in this case, the power that's consumed at this stage of operation, which is really taking me to the right sand graph, and that is the energy efficiency of my operations. How many operations did I do in a watt envelope or a milliwatt envelope? And what you see is that as I pull that voltage down, even though my frequency dropped, my energy efficiency shot way up. So I can exploit this going forward. I don't need a T-fit to get ridiculous energy efficiency. I can do the same thing with regular CMOS. I just have to pay for it in some form. Maybe that's area, maybe that's frequency, that's needing in turn more cores to get the same aggregate performance, even though each core is fantastically more efficient. So we actually built a test chip. Uh, it was a Pentium, it was demonstrated at IDF back in 2012, I remember. It was a full chip booting Windows 95 or 98, whatever it was. Powered off a little handheld solar cell with a light aimed at the solar cell, and it booted Windows during the demo. And a very fantastic design, learned a whole lot from it. It was a complete NTV processor, and it was designed to operate at that 280 to 320 millivolt range. Uh, worked great, learned a lot from it, and you'll notice that we're not actually manufacturing these in bulk on Xeon and Xeon Phi for a lot of very good reasons. But the learnings we took from this are very important. What you're really looking at is classic CMOS works just fine in the NTV range. So you've got normal operating in green, NTV, which is around that threshold voltage in yellow, and then sub-threshold in the orange color. And what you see is that your performance or your energy efficiency right, is very high at NTV, and it's not so good when you're up at the high-end, high-power range. So you have to decide right now, am I trying to race to get a job done in a certain amount of time, and then I'm going to crank up the voltage? Or do I have lots of time when I can bring the voltage down and run a little slower? Right? And I can look at the actual trends here, and I can see what the trade-off is. But look at how low that frequency is when I'm doing NTV or subthreshold. The energy efficiency may, may be nice, but I'm paying for it. And the question is, does that cost matter? Right? What's the impact? I can also look at fine-grained power management. This is another known technique. It's way beyond clock gating. Right. We have a lot of different thresholds we can use, but this is off of the uh, Polaris test chip back in 2006-2007, where we're demonstrating different ways to design the chip 
uh, and use aggressive power controls. So the idea is there are 21 dynamic sleep regions in the actual tile, and then you lay down a whole bunch of tiles in the die, and then we let the system turn dies on and off in a sleep state, which gets significant energy savings. Again, it's a known technique, but this is going beyond hardware. It's starting to have software implications. How are you structuring your code? How do you know when you can take advantage of something like this? So there's the three-prong approach as well, right? This is no longer just a hardware situation. Use an example of resiliency. Everybody's worried about, oh, I'm wishing down to seven nanometers. I'm going to have high variability. I'm going to have failures. I'm going to have all these parts. Right? What am I going to do about it? There's two ways to look at it. There are reactive measures, which is, oh, something failed. I took an ECC failure. I got a soft upset. What am I going to do about it? I have to react. I have to correct. I have to kill. I have to restart. There's also the proactive side, which is I'm going to plan ahead for this future, and I'm going to design my system at a software and an hardware level to periodically check itself and say, am I leading to a failure condition? Should I bring up my voltage? Should I start migrating work away from something? Right. And these need to come together based on different assumptions. What is my time scale of failure? What are the concerns I have around that time scale? If the time is really large, yeah, checkpoint every few hours. If the time is really short, we need a new technology. I can also look at this from a user experience. Right? I have your classic software layer, I've got the runtime sitting on top of the hardware, and then I have the reactive and proactive sides to this. How does that interact with the entire stack? I've got user code, I've got runtimes, I've got programming support tools. All these things need to be made aware of the underlying assumptions of the system. So in summary, right, and again, this is just a position on this post Moore's Law talk, right? There's nothing in sight today to replace CMOS. Nothing is ready, it's nothing's mature enough. We will continue seeing this, we have no choice. Not just Intel, everybody. Right? If you want this industry to continue to grow, then we need to be doing things, and one thing to do things with right now is seamless. We need to reclaim the efficiency, and to do that, we're all gonna have to be brave. We're gonna have to start thinking outside the box and go back to those techniques and say, do we really need cache coherency across an entire exascale machine? No, no you don't. Right? Do we really need cache coherency across a thousand cores on a die or a hundred cores on a die? Probably not. Right? Are you willing to take the complexity in software for a simpler, more efficient, more scalable hardware? So really what I'm saying is to go forward, you need to take your heads out of the sand, if you're part of the fun, and rethink what we've been doing and what we've been assuming. And I'll turn it back over now to John, who's dressed so nicely. <laughs>